Okay, this week we are going to begin Julian of Norwich, and to begin there, we'll we'll do some biographical stuff and get some overall ideas of her work. So, Julian of Norwich lived from 1342 to 1416. She was a Christian mystic and an anchoress, that's a, like a hermitess, best known for her work Revelations of Divine Love, or The Showings, as she called it in the original English. Almost nothing is known about her life, um, since being an anchoress, someone who lives in seclusion dedicated to God, she would have been disinclined to discuss details of whatever previous life she'd led in the world. Even her actual name is unknown, because the name Julian of Norwich comes from her residency at St. Julian's Church in Norwich, England. Her name may likely have not been Julian, but um, that was just the name of the church she was in. So according to her book, when she was 30 and a half years old, she was struck with an illness so severe that she knew she would not survive. The, the parish priest gave her last rites, and she began to experience visions of God. Uh, these visions lasted through the afternoon of May 13th, 1373. She had 15 of them. And the next evening, she had one more vision, a total of 16 visions. When she woke up, she was completely cured, and shortly afterwards, she wrote them down. This early work version of her visions is known today as the short text. At some point in the 1390s, she returned to the work and expanded it to create the manuscript we now know as the long text. Neither vision seems to have been known during her lifetime, but she was much sought after for spiritual counsel and became famous for her wisdom and piety. The mystic Marjorie Kemp visited her for, visited her for, for counsel in 1413, and along with bequests left to her in wills, substantiates Julian's historicity. So we know she existed, but we know very little about who she was personally. But her book of Revelations has intrigued and inspired audiences since they were first published by the Benedictine monk Serenus de Crecy under the title of 16 Revelations on the Love of God in 1670. Uh, the beauty of her work and the complete lack of biographical information on the author has encouraged later writers and scholars to construct their own biographies for her based on clues they seize upon in the book, which are then linked to knowledge in the life of the Middle Ages. In these life stories variously depict Julian as a widow who lost her family to the plague and renounced the world, a scholar who turned her back on society, and a lay person who only became an anchoress after her visions, among other possibilities. In reality, nothing can be claimed about Julian's life since that all that is known is what she mentions in her work, and from that one learns that she lived in Norwich as an anchoress, experienced a near-fatal illness, had a mother who tended her while sick, and was served by a maid. So we know very, very little about who she was. We have, we have her writings, and we can take some educated guesses based on her writings and some legal records from medieval England. Um, her historicity is established through bequests left in her wills between 1394 and 1316. One of these bequests mentions a maid named Sarah who served her and an earlier maid named Alice. She is also mentioned in glowing terms by the mystic Marjorie Kemp in her autobiography, the first autobiography written in English, The Book of Marjorie Kemp. Kemp experienced visions and voices which she believed came from God, but she was routinely mocked and doubted. She therefore went to Norwich to seek out Julian for validation. And her account says, And then I was commanded by our lords to go to an anchoress in the same city, who was called Dame Julian, for the anchoress was expert in such things and could give good advice. Kemp's description of Julian's answers to her is completely in keeping with Julian's own visions in her work. This detail validates the historicity of the author in that Kemp never mentions Julian's book anywhere in her autobiography, even though she never misses a chance to tell a reader of any spiritual work she has heard of. At one point, Julian says to Marjorie, The Holy Ghost never urges a thing against charity, and if he did, he would be contrary to his own self, for he is all charity. This sentiment could as easily be interpreted as coming from scripture, but 
Marjorie further relates Julian, referencing St. Paul and St. Jerome, and linking them back to her emphasis on the transcendence and imminence of divine love, which echoes Julian's visions. So she really emphasized God's love. So before we get to the ideas in her work, um, let's get an idea of the kind of life she lived. So further support for J Julian's historicity is that the bequests and details mentioned in her work are consistent with the life of an anchorist in the Middle a Ages. The treatise Anchorite Rule stipulated how an anchorite or anchorist should behave, how they should be enclosed after taking their vows, and how they should be tended by whatever institution they were attached to. So we have a scholar who wrote that before either hermit, anchor, or anchorist established themselves, they had to seek permission from the bishop, show that they had sufficient endowment or some prospect of maintenance, and were suitable in character. Anchorites and anchoresses must have sufficient funds to support one or two servants, as they cannot fetch food for themselves. Many had cells and towns where alms could be bestowed on them. Their primary work was prayer, though they might give spiritual counsel to those that sought it. An anchorage generally consisted of two or three rooms besides the chancel of a church. So they were basically hermits who lived in an apartment attached to a church and spent their time in prayer, and people could come to them for counseling or to ask for prayers, and they had to provide for themselves somehow. They had to have money. They had to find, or, or they need to be able to find some other way to provide for themselves so that they could have someone who would go get them food. They couldn't just go into town. Um, so one one interesting aspect of her life um, is that she, we noticed from the work of Marjorie Kemp that she seems to have been allowed to speak to people face to face through a small window in the wall. Uh, she most likely came from a family of means who were able to support her at the anchorage for most of her life since bequests for her support do not appear until later, after 1394. But but we also might consider the possibility that earlier records may have been lost. She may have been asking for money for a long time, but we don't have records of it that's, that have survived. Uh, the fact that her mother was present during her illness suggests that she came from an upper-class family of wealth, since such families were always allowed special privileges denied lower classes, and it is a certainty that no anchoress of modest means would have been allowed family visitation. So she was probably rich. Um, we don't know. We don't know exactly how rich, but um, she could provide for herself and her and her family was able to keep an eye on her when she was ill. That if you were less wealthy, this may not have worked. Um, once an anchoress had entered her cell, she was considered dead to the world. But when you when you became when you became an anchoress, that that was it. You took your vows and you spent your life in prayer. Um, so we have some scholars who des describe in the ritual that and how they spent their lives that women committed themselves to living out their lives as anchoresses enclosed in cells attached to monasteries, convents, and sometimes even castles. The anchoresses were consigned to their cells with the saying of a mass, usually as with lepers shut up in their colonies, that of the dead. So the priest would say the uh, mass for the requiem mass, the funeral mass for um, people entering this lifestyle. Holy water sprinkled in a cell. The recluse prostrated herself on on a bier, the um, which is like a cheap coffin almost. He just lay, lay the body on it. Earth was scattered over her, and the officiating priest left the cell with the instructions: let them block up the entrance to the house. The cell was usually composed of more than one room, and often two or more anchoresses lived in adjacent cells with servants to them to provide them with food and other necessities. The recluse's time was spent in prayer and sometimes in work such as embroidery. Often they were consulted as wise women and spiritual advisors. And We know from other textual evidence that in the Middle Ages, priests were very devoted to nuns and saw them as their um, spiritual superiors, that uh, they were not seen as a lesser, lesser caste by any means. They were seen as... Um, people who really had a special status in the community. So, um, so you entered, you entered the cell and you died to the world. Uh, it was, it was a, it was serious business. So, um, all of this, so everything we just talked about, um, is consistent with we know, what we know about her life from Marjorie Kemp. It's also possible that, um, Julian, she took religious vows when she was a young, young woman, um, even a child by today's standards, because many aristocratic young women 
they preferred a life of prayer and um, retreat from the world to a life of court intrigue, domination and marriage, and dying in childbirth. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure. Quite, I'm sure you might be able to see the appeal of that. Um, and you, you even have saints uh, who would write about uh, that they pref they they preferred uh, religious life to marriage. One of the, one of the perks being that um, they're not going to die in childbirth. That uh, this this was this was a huge deal in the past. Um, it is still a huge deal in parts of the world, and obviously that wouldn't be their only reason for entering religious life, but it had some perks. Just as just as also for many uh, religious monks and nuns, um, one of the perks is getting to be able to do a scholarship without um, a spouse nagging you. It's, there are, though it is death to the world, it does come with its perks for some people. Uh, we know um, another great mystic of the Middle Ages, Hildegard of Bingen. Uh, she's a saint now, daughter of the church. Uh, she entered the convent when she was seven years old and was quite happy there. And she wrote music and medical textbooks. Yeah. They're still quite interesting. So, now let's get, let's get to uh, the actual details of Julian's writing. So, whoever she was and wherever she came from, she had a near-death experience when she was 30, and that inspired her to write the book that had made her famous. So, we have a quote, quote from her. She wrote, And when I was 30 and a half years old, God sent me a bodily sickness in which I lay for three days and three nights, and on the fourth night I received all the rites of the Holy Church and did not expect to live until day. But after this, I suffered on for two days and two nights, and on the third night, I often thought that I was on a point of death, and those who were around me also thought this. But in this, I was very sorrowful and reluctant to die. Not that there was anything on earth that it pleased me to live for, or anything of which I was afraid, for I trusted in God, but it was because I wanted to go on living to love God better and longer, and living so, obtain grace to know and love God more, as he is in the bliss of heaven." For it seemed to me that all the time I lived here was very little and short in comparison with the bliss which is everlasting. So she she prayed to survive her illness so that she would be able to come to know God more in this life. It wasn't out of selfish reasons. It was because she wanted, she wanted to continue growing in love for God in this life. In her opening chapter, she says she prayed for this kind of illness since she was a young girl. After hearing the story of Saint Cecilia, who received three wounds to her neck from a sword, died, and was translated into heaven. She said afterwards she prayed for three graces from God. To have a recollection of Christ's passion, to have a bodily sickness so severe that it should appear mortal, and to have three wounds from God. Contrition, compassion, and longing for God. So she was very religious even from a very young age, that she, even from her childhood, prayed that she would receive a terrible illness not because the illness was a good thing she wasn't seeking the illness for itself but she was seeking it as a way of participating in christ's suffering that she um she had this devotion to christ's passion it wasn't it wasn't just um suffering for its own sake and this is a theme that comes up in the writings of mystics that they welcome suffering in order to participate in christ's passion uh, you have so you have you have some mystics um who who take a more gentle approach that they uh, want to be consecrated to God's mercy and receive mercy for those who refuse to receive it in this life. But um, that, that's that's not important right this minute. Don't get me started on it. Um, so the recollection of Christ's passion and three wounds, she says, would arise from the sickness which would draw her closer to an understanding and the love of God. She writes, In this sickness, I wanted to have every kind of pain bodily and spiritual, which I should have if I were dying, every fear and assault from devils, and every other kind of pain except the departure of the spirit. For I hoped that this would be profitable to me when I should die, because I desired soon to be with my God. After recovering from my illness, Julian wrote the short text, which he later expanded. The short text is an unadorned account of what she saw and what she thought the visions meant, without further elaboration. So she would spend uh, years in meditation um, to understand the meaning of her visions in light of the Catholic faith. She was a, she was a believing Catholic, of course, but um, 
when when a mystic has visions, they do need to prayerfully meditate on them so that they don't understand them in a way that's against the faith. So she spent many years in prayer meditating on what happened to her. And um, in thir around 1388, she finally came to an under an adequate understanding of um, what the visions meant, and she began to write them down. But, and the, the most famous part of her visions is that um, because God is eternal love um, and because because um, God is, is not here to condemn the world, all will be well in the end. That's her most famous saying, all will be well and all will be well and all manner of things will be well. That is That is the core of Julian's message. Everything is going to be okay. So, she receives this message in her 13th revelation. We'll get to that, I guess, in a couple weeks. Um, she understands that all would have been well in life for everyone if there had been no sin, but because there was, Jesus had to suffer and die, and people every day suffer and die. She recognizes that this is a dangerous line of thought because she is questioning the will of God, and she says she knows the impulse to think this was greatly to be shunned. But she cannot help herself and grieves over the suffering of humanity and caused by sin and death. Jesus comforts her, though, telling her that sin is necessary, but that all will be well, and all will be well, and every all manner of things will be well. She understands the nature of sin is transitory, and having, quote, no kind of substance, no share in being, nor can it be recognized except by the pain caused by it, and further recognizes that what one calls sin is an important aspect in the life of the flesh and that it makes us know ourselves and ask for mercy. So when we say, when she says sin is necessary and that it's an important aspect of life, she doesn't mean it's good to sin. What she means is that it's fitting that saint, that it's in a, in a sense fitting that sin exists because it allows God to show his mercy to us that in spite of the evil of sin and the evil it brings into the world, God is still able to, uh, show mercy to us that it's um the pur the purpose of the purpose of sin so to speak not that sin really has any real substance because evil doesn't really exist evil is a lack god is able to give sin a purpose in spite of it by al by allowing good to be drawn out of it so that's that's what julian is meaning by this she's not saying that sin is good she's saying that god can bring good out of it so she, um, her other very important contribution is to talk about the um, motherhood of God. She has this image of God as a mother. Now this isn't this isn't something that she made up. It's not some radical image uh, removed from Orthodox Christian belief. It's an image from the Bible that there are psalms and prophecies that use the image of God as a loving mother. Um, I just had the verse in my head a couple hours ago. It's in Isaiah. Um, God says something like, "I will, I will never, I will never forget you as a mother never forgets her children." So God compares Himself to a mother in the Bible. So this is not some radical thing that she made up. Some some critics try to frame it as something radical that she was some kind of um, uh, heterodox, you know, kind of heretical. Um, rebel against the church. This is absolutely not true. Anyone who says this just does not understand what the Catholic faith really teaches. I'm going to straight up say it like that. It's a misrepresentation. So she wrote about God's motherhood um, saying, I understand three ways of contemplating motherhood in God. The first is the foundation of our nature's creation. The second is his taking of our nature where the motherhood of grace begins. The third is in the motherhood of work. And in that, by the same grace, everything is penetrated in length and breadth, in height and depth without end, and it is all one love. That She, she sees the, the motherhood of God as rep representing the universal love of God and how God's love embraces all of creation. That um, She writes, The mother's service is nearest, readiest, and surest. Nearest because it is most natural, readiest because it is most loving. And sh surest because it is truest. No one ever might or could perform this office fully except for him. 
We know that all our mothers bear us for pain of her death. Oh, what is that? But our true mother Jesus, for he alone bears for us joy and for endless life. Blessed may he be. So he carries us within him in our love and travail until the full time when he wanted to suffer the sharpest thorns and cruel pains that ever were or will be, and at last he died. And he revealed in these great surpassing words of love, if I could suffer more, I would suffer more. But she, she talks about Mother Jesus. Again, this is not, um, there is nothing heretical or unorthodox about this. This is, mystics will use um, difficult images in their writings not as a way to contradict the church or to rebel or anything like that, but be because the experiences they have are so difficult to put into words, they need to use difficult words in order to explain it. So she, um, she, she says in her writings, she's unlettered that she wasn't educated, but, um, her writings sh show familiarity with the Bible, of course, uh, with the church fathers, um, with St. Augustine and, uh, with our favorite from the other class, the consolation of philosophy. And she probably knew that from reading Chaucer's translation. Uh, so um, I'm going to upload a video for Thursday. So we have something to work with for a live session on Friday. We'll read the first revelation and go from there. Um, this is one of the greatest works in medieval English literature. The first uh, write, writing of a woman published in English. I mean, written in English. And... Um, it's a great, it's a very important message of hope and um, showing us that God loves us and brings good out of all evil. So, so until Thursday.